Hello, everybody. We'll just start with intros. Um, my name is Jaron Dorman. I am the creative content manager at Gravity Sketch. And uh, I get to have conversations like this with um, amazing people in our community and beyond. Um, Tim Zarki is definitely the beyond, uh, I would say, but also related in, in some way and, and allow him to, to dive into a little bit of that and what that looks like. But um, yeah, so I just, I love talking to our community, learning about their process, their journey, how they get and how they got into design and, and how they work. And this is definitely going to be an interesting one. Um, as, as Tim has had quite a, a, a journey exploring different tools, um, as I'm sure you'll get more into, uh, what those will be, but, um, it's great uh, that you all are, are joining us for this conversation today. So, um, thank you. And Tim, do you want to just give a, a quick little intro of yourself? Yeah, of course. Um, and maybe I can just kind of start the, uh, start my presentation here because yeah, um, that'd be great. I just want to talk a little bit about um, kind of what uh, what we have in store for everyone today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my backgrounds, um, talk a little bit about the work that I do for Meta, which is my day job. And then the rest of the uh, presentation is really going to be uh, just a bunch of case studies that uh, we're going to walk through. And those case studies are kind of spanning a pretty wide range of different disciplines. Um, we're going to talk about some kind of animation, visualization stuff, product visualization stuff, uh, some really in-depth 3D modeling workflow stuff, uh, and then a lot of generative design things that I'm really passionate about working on lately. So these are some things that, uh, some of it has, is stuff that I've shared publicly, and some of it is actually stuff that um, I don't think anyone has really seen before. Um, so I'm excited to uh, have this uh, venue for being able to share some of what I've been up to. Um, and I guess now I can just kind of jump into talking about myself. So <clears throat> my name is Tim Zarkey. Uh, I'm a 3D artist working at Meta in San Francisco, where I live. Um, I work remotely, so I'm not actually going to the office every day. So I work from my apartment here in San Francisco. Um, I call myself a 3D artist, um, but really I studied industrial design. So I'm kind of like a industrial designer slash 3D artist. Um, but 3D art is really what I do. Uh, on my day to day these days, so I don't spend that much time doing industrial design anymore. So I generally refer to myself as a 3D artist now. Um, but this is kind of like my sort of over overview of all the different things that I'm interested in. It's really um, difficult for me to try to like pigeonhole myself in any particular way. Um, you know, I, I started out studying industrial design, but I'm also really interested in things like you know graphic design and typography. Um, originally I wanted to be a concept artist. So like I have this soft spot for concept art. Um, I've picked up a little bit of like motion design and VFX skills, um, over the years, um, super passionate about generative design now and creative programming as well. I do quite a bit of programming now. Um, also really interested in things like architecture and, and game design, building computers, education, photography, all kinds of stuff. Um, so uh, you know, people, people say like, you know, sh is it okay to be a generalist or do you have to like really focus in on just one discipline? And I, I would say like, I'm, I'm a good example that you can kind of be interested in everything and try and do a little bit of everything and, and still be successful. So, um, that's kind of how I think about myself. Um, people who follow me might have seen some of these projects before. So this is kind of just a little snapshot of the, the type of work that I do in my personal uh, personal work, um, you know, I do a lot of like conceptual industrial design projects that are trying to kind of explore a particular idea within the realm of industrial design and then visualize that idea really beautifully. Um, also do have that kind of like still have an interest in concept art and occasionally I do some like 3D concept art sort of projects, especially like I'm really interested in like space exploration and science fiction and stuff like that. So whenever I do uh, those sort of projects. I always end up thinking about like spaceships and airplanes and stuff like that. Um, also really into footwear. Um, so I've done some uh, footwear design projects as well, both professionally and uh, personal work. And then uh, in general, just like 3D visualization um, and animation, um, or I guess some motion design stuff are, are two things that I'm really uh, passionate about too. So those are kind of like um, I guess like the, the core things that I, I might be known for, but also more recently, I'm really into generative design. So i um, really interested in using tools like Houdini, uh, as well as even more like game engine type uh, software like Unity to explore uh, more procedural and generative ways to create uh, 3D forms 
um, to try and create things that are inspired by nature. Um, and this is really like um, the area that I've spent, I would say the most of my free time exploring uh, recently. And so I'm really excited to share more um, from kind of the generative design side of things today. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and then a little bit more about my background. So uh, I originally grew up in Joshua Tree, California, which is like a, a very popular place to go on vacation, but not a lot of people uh, I know actually live there. So it's kind of a, a pretty desolate place to grow up. And, and when I grew up there, like it was also not popular at all. Like nobody knew about it. So it was like very sort of off the beaten path. Um, and that gave me a lot of time to myself. I'm an only child as well. So like I had a lot of time to myself to uh, just sit on the computer and explore and uh, I got into 3D modeling like back in 2005, which is probably when I was like in maybe seventh or eighth grade. So I wasn't even in high school yet. And I had a copy of Blender. Um, and I like to show this stuff because this is like where I started really in 3D, um, just really struggling to learn Blender from like, you know, online tutorials and stuff like that that existed back then. And the user interface was really, really uh, difficult to figure out. Um, and I, I probably gave up at least three times um, trying to learn Blender before it started to stick and before I started to really um, be able to create things that I wanted to create and sort of saw in my mind. Um, so this is kind of, you know, where things started for me. And then uh, after a few years, this was 2010. So this is like at the end of high school, um, I was really... You know, I spent pretty much all of high school in my free time trying to get better at 3D and better at Blender. And I still wasn't that great, but I like started to figure out, you know, how, how to kind of create some of the forms that I saw in my head, how to create things that were from my imagination and sort of realize some of those ideas. Um, I wasn't very good at rendering yet. I was still using like the internal rendering engine that Blender came with back then, which was really basic. Um, it's a lot better now. But um, these are some of the things that I was I was working on, and um, having that kind of interest in 3D and that interest in creating things from my imagination, um, I was also really into uh, drawing at the time. And a lot of the 3D things that I wanted to make were like, you know, vehicles and sort of mechanical things that were very grounded in reality. And so um, I felt like when I was thinking about what to do with my career. I really felt like industrial design kind of captured a lot of the different things that I was interested in, or like at least gave me a, a, a venue or a pathway to be able to uh, use those skills in my, in my career. So, you know, drawing, 3D modeling, 3D rendering, figuring out uh, how to solve different kinds of problems, and then also just like creating things from my imagination. You know, I felt like industrial design really took all of those things and, and sort of wrapped them up in one sort of career path. So I decided to go to uh, DAP um, at the University of Cincinnati to study industrial design, uh, which was a five-year program and did a ton of internships along the way. Um, the last internship that I did was for a design studio called Minimal, which was based in Chicago. And uh, they were kind enough to invite me back after that internship to work there full-time after I graduated from school. So after Graduating, uh, I moved to San Francisco, and at the time, Minimal was opening a, a very small office in San Francisco, and I was kind of their first sort of full-time uh, designer, aside from the guy who's running the office there. Um, and so I got to kind of get a really crash course in uh, industrial, doing professional industrial design, and you know had a lot of responsibility placed on me because I was really the only uh, junior designer working in this office, and so um, we my boss and I like, you know, divided uh, the work on a lot of projects and I got a lot of my own projects to, to help design. Um, and I had to, it was, it was stressful, but I, I learned a lot super quickly from that experience. Um, and uh, here's a few little things that I worked on when I was at Minimal. Um, the, the Misfit Ray, which is the uh, fitness tracker down in the, uh, bottom left was one of the first like really big projects that I helped work on. And um, during my time at Minimal, I kind of still had this real passion for 3D and for 3D visualization. And um, I really kind of showed that to my, my boss and the people I was working with, and they realized that I had that passion. And so they really created a lot of opportunities for me to do that for Minimal. And so there were a lot of projects where um, I might help out with the industrial design and be one of the designers on the project, but maybe like the final design 
wasn't something that I really uh, helped out with that much. But then I would still like sort of help do like the visualization, help create beautiful images for the clients and help to kind of tell the story of the, the project and of the product. Um, and then even towards the end of my time there, um, I was doing some like full, you know, strictly like visualization and motion design projects um, for minimal, which is really cool. Um, and then uh, I decided to <clears throat> part ways with minimal, which is very sad because I, I really loved all the people that I worked with there. It was an amazing company to work for. Um, still have really fond memories of my time there. I think about them all the time. Um, but I was interested in continuing to pursue 3D and continuing to pursue um, kind of that side of my interests and maybe not do industrial design anymore as like my full-time job. And so I had an opportunity come up with, uh, with Oculus, which is uh, <clears throat> owned by Facebook. And now all of that is kind of wrapped up under the name Meta. Um, and I, I got an opportunity to kind of be the first real sort of product visualization expert at Meta. So back when I joined the company, um, I was really the the only person who was dedicated to doing that type of work full time. And um, back then, you know, Facebook didn't really have a lot of hardware projects. Um, so it was possible for me as like a the sole sort of product visualization person to do a lot of the work that needed to be done, although still a lot of it was outsourced to agencies. Um, but during my time there, um, it really became apparent that uh, we needed a team of people to do uh, product visualization. And so I kind of got to help build that team. And I'm going to talk more about them um, in just a moment. Um, so that's kind of the transition into uh, the work that I do for Meta, but I'm just going to pause for a moment. Jaren, do you, um, do you have any, uh, anything you wanted to talk about before I start talking about uh, my work at Meta? Um, yeah, no, thank you, Tim, for that intro. That was awesome. Um, I just want to say proud, uh, also proud alumni of, of DAP right. as well. That's right. Personally. So um, it's, it's, it's just great to, to see your background and see your journey. <laughs> Um, and, and I think that some of us can relate in a way to, um, just those like early, um, maybe not in the most specific, most specifically to your story, but just like, you know, those little kernels of what drove you to, um, continue exploring and find that avenue of what would allow you to take that further, which in this, in your case, obviously was, was DAP, um, to explore those things or industrial design actually more specifically to, um, explore those things. Um, and I think that we all can relate in that way of just trying to find something to feed that creative sort of impulse of like, what, what, what do I, what do I like? What am I into? What is this sort of, you know, what is, how do I express, you know, the ideas in my mind? Cause I, I, if I think back to high school age, you know, college age, even, um, I felt like a lot of my interests were a lot of, a lot of different areas. And, um, it was, it was hard to define, you know, sort of where to go. And I really like what you talked about in the beginning of being a generalist and it's okay to be a generalist. It's okay to, to be interested in a lot of things. And, um, I think as we dive in here, people will really see that it's, it's, it's okay to really dive in and explore those things deeply um, you know, you don't have to be, I am this, I am that, um, you know, you really can't just have fun. <laughs> and, and yeah, one, uh, one thing I wanted to say about that is like, um, <clears throat> I feel like the, the interests that I have now, <clears throat> a lot of them are still the same interests that I had back in high school when I was just learning 3d and wanting to kind of, um, realize things from my imagination and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I think like I, I saw industrial design as like an opportunity to take those interests and funnel them into a particular career path. And I think once I got into industrial design, I realized that I was not getting what I wanted out of it as far as being able to pursue the things that I got into it. You know, the reasons why I got into it in the first place were really, you know, more on the creative 3D side than they were on the actual nuts and bolts, like wanting to make real product side. And I think once I realized that I was like, okay, maybe I need to, you know, even though this is what I dedicated, you know, five years of my life to studying and three years of my life to starting my career in, maybe I need to part ways with it because, you know, it's, 
I still have these interests and I don't feel like they're quite being um, like, I, I don't feel like my potential is being met by, you know, just doing industrial design work. And so that's why I ultimately decided to, uh, to leave minimal and, and to go work at Meta because it felt like an opportunity to sort of start a new chapter in my career and sort of get back to pursuing some of the things that, um, you know, I was, have been interested in the whole time, which is just, you know, 3d and, and rendering and creating beautiful images and, and animations and telling stories. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the, uh, yeah, it's, the it's journey obviously, that I went on. yeah, it's obviously carried out since the, the, those early days that you showed there. Um, well, I don't want to take away too much time from, from your, your presentation here. So yeah, if you, you can, if you want to dive right into what you were going to show there. Cool. Yeah. So let me talk about my, uh, my experience in meta. So I, I alluded to the fact that, you know, I joined as kind of the, the sole visualization person, um, at the company, which is kind of insane when you think about how big of a company it is, but <clears throat> they just really didn't have that in-house. Like either they, like the industrial design team would create, um, a lot of the visuals of the products, or they would just outsource that work to various agencies, um, whenever there was a product launch. And so, <clears throat> You know, around the time when I joined, um, I I kind of plugged myself into doing a lot of that work and worked um, pretty much by myself for about a year before um, I was given an opportunity to um, start to build a team and, and essentially hire. Um, I, I was given the opportunity to either be the manager of the team or find someone to be the manager of the team. And I didn't really feel like I wanted to manage a team. I didn't think that that was my calling at that moment. And so I decided to uh, try to find someone to manage the team. And I was incredibly fortunate to find uh, Clement Balavon, who is the uh, the manager of the new product visualization team at Meta. And he's done an absolutely incredible job. And he and I together have been able to uh, build an incredible team of artists who are all <clears throat> bringing something different to the table. Like we're all capable of doing beautiful product visuals, but each of us has very specific um, strengths that really um, create a very well-rounded team. And so I'm, I'm really grateful to, um, to be a part of it. And honestly, the, the team that we've built is really the, um, the main reason why I'm still at Meta um, and haven't decided to do something else at this point. I've been at Meta for four years now. Um, and you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, <clears throat> I have these people to thank for um, making it a really enjoyable experience to work there. Um, so getting into some of the actual work that we do, um, it, it is very product visualization focused, at least, um, the work that I can share at this point is very product visualization focused. And, you know, when I started, it was around the days of like, um, Oculus go and Oculus quest, the first Oculus quest. And so a lot of the work that I was doing, uh, when I first joined the company was to create some, you know, the sort of hero visuals of these products. Um, and so like the first real, like big project that I did was, um, creating all of the visuals for the launch of the, uh, original Oculus quest. And it was kind of a surreal experience to like, you know, go from being this, uh, sort of like big fish in a small, small pond of working at a company like uh, minimal where the team is, you know, a couple dozen people, um, to a company of literally like tens of thousands of people. And, you know, the work that I'm creating is being seen by such a, you know, orders of magnitude, greater audience. Um, so I felt a lot of pressure um, when I was kind of getting used to that um, sort of transition. And um, it was really surreal to work on Quest because it was really the first big project that I, that I worked on. Um, also worked on um, the Rift S, which came out a little bit after. Um, but it was really surreal to kind of, you know, have just joined this massive company and then, you know, first big project I work on and Mark Zuckerberg is like presenting on stage, you know, in front of the renders that I made, um, which, you know, I just never would have thought that that would be a thing that would be, uh, part of my career. And, and now like, that's a pretty normal thing and something I've gotten used to, but, um, it was definitely like a special moment to, um, just to have that kind of uh, like, obviously nobody, nobody knew that I made those images and it doesn't really matter that anybody knows who I am, but it's just cool to um, see the work, um, you know, on display at a, a huge conference like that being presented by, you know, CEO like Mark Zuckerberg. Um, that was definitely a, just a cool moment for me and something I still think, think back on every once in a while. Um, 
But more recently, um, you know, the team has really grown since then. Those were all projects that I worked on pretty much by myself. Um, it was around the time Clement was joining. Um, and since then, um, you know, Quest 2 is really the, um, the project that the, the whole team has really um, begun to work on. That's kind of when we were, when Clement joined and when we were really building the team is when we started to work on Quest 2. And it was really cool because, you know, marketing took a completely different direction with this product. It's much lighter. It's much more approachable. It's more friendly. It's more optimistic. Um, it kind of gets away from the sort of like very stereotypical kind of gamery, you know, black and RGB color type thing that we had going on with uh, some of the previous products. And so it was really refreshing to work on and also really an opportunity for, for us to figure out how to work together as a team and uh, share the responsibilities of, of creating all of the, all of the assets, which you know, included uh, stills as well as animations. We, we also do the artwork that appears on the front of the box. Um, so there's just a lot of different sort of touch points that we all have to, um, to work on. And um, it was a really rewarding project. Um, you know, these are the kind of really nitty gritty details that we get into with um, creating the visuals for the products. Uh, it's really fun to, you know, get the, get the data from the uh, industrial designers and the engineers and really try and make it as beautiful as we can make it. And as true to the uh, industrial design intent as well. Um, we we uh, are in very close uh, communication with the industrial designers to get their feedback on, you know, what their vision is for the product and sort of how they imagine it to be presented and what's important to them as far as the, you know, communicating the design intents. And then we have to kind of take that information and we also have to take the sort of goals of the marketing team and sort of what they think is important and how they want to market the product and we kind of are the bridge between those two groups of people and those two different sort of um, sets of priorities and we kind of are the team that figures out how do those things come together to you know create beautiful imagery that sort of satisfies everyone um, on both sides of that spectrum. Um, we also do a lot of like, uh, compositing with photos. So these are like, um, photo shoot photos that we render the product into, um, tried to make it as seamless as possible. Um, I also had the opportunity to do the, um, the branding for not, not the whole branding, but part of the visual brand for, um, for the Oculus Connect 6 conference. Um, so I, I got to do some like abstract Houdini simulations that ended up being a big part of the visual language for that whole conference. Um, which is like another moment where it's really cool to kind of see <clears throat> see the work on a big stage like that. Um, and this kind of kicked off a uh, uh, another part of the work that we do at Meta. Um, we're, we're trying to kind of position ourselves as not just a, uh, a product visualization team, but more of a sort of overarching visualization team that can also work on more kind of like branding oriented, more abstract content that's not just... Um, beautiful renderings of the product. And we're, we're finally in a position where we're, we're starting to do a lot of that. And so unfortunately I can't really talk about uh, any of that work at the moment or show any of it because it's all, you know, stuff that's kind of in progress now, but I'm really happy that the team has kind of been able to spread our wings a little bit and, and diversify the types of work that we do for the company. So we're, we're the product visualization experts, but we're also uh, a team of really capable, um, you know, visualization artists who can do, you know, all manner of interesting uh, motion design and abstract work um, that um, is going to be something that touches a lot of different parts of the company, not just uh, the product visuals. So that's kind of my like, you know, short synopsis of um, the work that I do at Meta. I think that's the end of the section. So now we're going to dive into a, um, <clears throat> I guess technically this is a professional project that I did, but it was much more of like a side project or like a freelance project. Um, <clears throat> And this is for a, uh, a keyboard. So this is kind of a, uh, a marketing sort of motion piece that I was part of a team that created for this uh, keyboard called the Ramaworks Kara. And I'm gonna play this video. Hopefully the quality over Zoom will be okay, but I just want people to be able to see what we created before I talk about it.
I want to first uh, note that uh, this is the team of uh, <clears throat> 3D artists that I worked with on the project. Um, Todd really deserves the the bulk of the credit for just facilitating the project. Um, he was kind of the director of the the whole piece, as well as one of the animators, and you know, kind of helped define the the art direction and the overall. Um, just tone and and story of the of the piece, and then Eddie and Jesus are both uh, 3D artists and motion designers who helped out with uh, pretty much everything. We we all kind of touched everything to a certain extent, but um, they they also did a ton of the uh, just motion design, lighting, and really my role was to um, help out with some of the simulation stuff, so like the liquid sort of injection molding effects, kind of like the the beads swirling around, like a lot of the Houdini stuff. Um, that uh, you know, Eddie and Jesus and Todd um, are, weren't necessarily. I'm sure they could have figured it out if they really wanted to, but they they wanted my help to try and figure out how to do those things. Um, so, you know, the first thing that I really helped out with on this was trying to figure out how to create that sort of liquid plastic injection molded sort of effect. And so, this was something that uh, uh, I did in Houdini and really started out just exploring some of the different liquid simulation options that are available. And, you know, a lot of them are, are kind of geared towards simulating things like water and stuff like that. Or like when you set them up by default, like they're sort of uh, too, too liquid, like in plastic, you really want it to feel kind of like thick and sort of uh, viscous and, and slow moving. And, you know, none of us, I think like, you know, in a real injection molding process, like it happens so fast that uh, you would never really, even if the mold was transparent, it would, you would never really get that effect. So it's really kind of like trying to imagine like, you know, how can we make injection molding look really cool if we were able to see it and slow it way down? What, what could that look like? Um, <clears throat> so these are some of my really early tests, which were just like filling a cube with liquid plastic, trying to figure out how to make that look good. Um, these started to get a little bit closer to what I wanted as far as like the viscosity of the plastic. So I was playing around with, um, there's a uh, GPU accelerated fluid simulation technique in Houdini called uh, pop fluid, I think. And I was really playing around with um, trying to dial in the, uh, the viscosity of, the, of the, the, the fluid to make it really feel like plastic and feel kind of sticky and feel like it kind of solidifies as it, as it goes. Um, but then of course, like, you know, th these are just happening in a cube. <clears throat> and so I needed to really figure out like, okay, how do I actually make that happen in the product? You know, I can't just have a cube. It needs to actually look like the finished keyboard when it's done. Um, and that was the biggest challenge. I think like the first challenge was just dialing in the, the properties of the liquid, but then, you know, figuring out how to actually mold a, a, a detailed product and have it look really good when it's done. Um, that was the hard part. So these were some really early tests. And basically what I was doing is I was taking the geometry of the, the housing of the keyboard and um, you can convert that into something called a VDB, which is a, a voxelized uh, version of the original. So it's kind of like, it's no longer made out of polygons. It's made out of voxels, which are just like little, little cubes, basically, if you imagine that. And that actually works really well as a, uh, excuse me, as a collider for the fluid simulation. So the fluid simulation is actually bumping up against those voxels. And the only problem with the voxels is that um, when you're done, because the, the fluid is also um, a VDB, so it's also made up of voxels. And the only problem with that is when you're done, it looks really soft. Like even when you convert it back to a mesh, like the edges are all kind of like soft looking, like in this middle image here, it doesn't look as crisp and like defined as it would be in the, uh, you know, like the final injection molded uh, product. And so really um, the, the hard part there was to figure out like, how do I get that detail back and how do I make the final thing look as good as the original? And what I ended up doing is like taking a really, really high resolution voxel version of the whole keyboard and essentially just subtracting out the, uh, the kind of loose one um, from that so that it kind of cut all of those details out at the perfect um, level of detail at the end so that the the final version it's still not as high fidelity as the um as the original but you can't really tell it's unless you're looking at it really closely um so that kind of solved that problem and these are just some tests of the um <clears throat> me trying to figure out like how do i 
fill fill this keyboard like where does the fluid start from what direction is it moving how do i arc direct the uh the flow of the uh the movement of the liquid and as well as like how do i light it how do i make it look like plastic that was another thing i was working on trying to figure out and then also looking at like you know how does that fluid interact with the <clears throat> the rest of the product because there's other components in there that the fluid is kind of forming around and I wanted to make sure that it looks, you know, really good as it's kind of flowing around those other parts. Um, so there, we, we kind of knew like the, the, the CMF, the keyboard, there were some specific colors that we were trying to match. And so I had to do some that were kind of opaque and then some that were transparent to make sure that it looked good in both cases. Um, and then some that incorporated both uh, opaque and transparent parts at the same time. And um, I have a little video here. There's no audio, but this just shows kind of how the, what, what sort of the uh, the final liquid simulations looked like. And um, I was able to basically create what are called Alembic files, which are basically animated 3D files that I could send to the other animators. And they were able to import those into Cinema 4D, which is the <clears throat> software they were using to animate the rest of the, uh, the rest of the spot with. And then kind of like choose, you know, what sections they wanted to incorporate into the shots that they were working on. Um, and sort of uh, maybe even like speed them up or slow them down, <clears throat> depending on the um, depending on the shot that they're working on and kind of the the timing that they needed. <clears throat> so let me go to the next one. Oh wait, it's the same one. Oh, here we go. So this is what it looks like rendered. Um, so this is close to what we were able to actually do in the uh, the final piece. And overall, like I'm, I'm pretty proud of the um, the quality that I was able to get to with that. <clears throat> this is my first time really doing any kind of fluid simulation for any sort of like uh, motion piece. So it was really like when I said yes to doing it, I was like, I'm gonna say yes, but I, I really hope I can figure this out. <laughs> it's gonna be kind of a challenge. Um, <clears throat> so I was a little bit stressed out, but um, I'm real, I'm really proud of the uh, the end yeah. result that I was able to come up with for that. And then um, I have just a few like stills from the video that show, you know, kind of how the uh, the liquid simulation was used. It was really cool to kind of like have these moments where there's, you know, pieces of um, the keyboard that are kind of having the liquid form around them. Um, that was really like the, the motion designers who were working on the project really found some like really nice moments to incorporate the, um, the fluid simulations into the shots that they were doing. Um, I think it, the end result is, is pretty magical, especially considering that like we were all working on this sort of independently. So like <clears throat> I was over here in my corner, you know, doing the fluid sims, they were figuring out like, you know, what compositions do we want for these different shots and how are we going to incorporate Tim's work, you know, into those and how are we going to light it, all that stuff. Um, so it was definitely a team effort on, on everything. And <clears throat> I'm really proud of the, uh, the way that those shots turned out. Um, this one was cool because you kind of see like the different layers of the keyboard coming together and the liquid is still kind of flowing up a little bit around everything as it's all sort of being assembled. Um, um, as fluid focused, but this one is kind of like a, a vortex of these little plastic beads. And um, <clears throat> these were, this was another Houdini um, sort of, setup that I had to come up with where we wanted these beads to kind of represent like the plastic pellets that would get melted in an injection molding process. So like, this is kind of like the raw material and um, they're all X's and O's because that was like the Rama works branding. Um, so we kind of tried to hide little X's and O's and <clears throat> a lot of the different uh, shots from this piece we were working on. Um, so, you know, this is kind of just like a, a big vortex of all these beads, um, both uh, opaque ones and transparent ones. Here's a video. This is just like a test and I wanted them to like collide with each other. So there's a lot of actual um, <clears throat> pretty CPU intensive collisions that are happening between the, um, the different, uh, <clears throat> different particles. And the, I, I was able to kind of save a little bit of uh, computational power on that by um, just representing each one as a sphere. So they're not actually like colliding with the detailed geometry. They're just colliding with like essentially like a sphere collision box on each one. So they're not it's not having to calculate the exact, you know, interactions between those shapes. Um, it's just kind of calculating a, a rough, rough shape that bounces off each other, which is a lot easier for it to do. And then they asked me to melt it. So 
you know, we're, we're using these particles to represent, or these little beads to represent like the raw material from the injection molding process. And the next idea we had was like, okay, well, how do we transition between that and actually injection molding the keyboard? And it's like, well, you have to melt the raw material before you can injection mold anything with it. <clears throat> so they were asking me to uh, try to figure out a way to go from that sort of solid bead to a melted one and have the beads kind of swirl as they're melting. This was by far like the most complicated shot. These are just some tests that I did of like trying to like go from solid to kind of a liquid state, um, which is really uh, difficult to control. Like it was easy to make it happen, but it was really hard to art direct it. Um, here's a shot of me. You can actually see the individual particles here in Houdini. A trigger that would cause them to melt, but you can see they don't melt completely. Like there's still like little bits of, you know, solid ones that are, um, that are kind of floating around. I'm getting a message that my, my internet connection is unstable. Can you hear me? Okay. You sound good on this end. <clears throat> okay. just wanted to, there check. was a, there was a very brief breakout, uh, kind of, but it's, it's coming through pretty nice. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Um, so that was kind of like my, my rough, uh, <clears throat> rough test there. And then this is what it looks like rendered, um, which is pretty crazy. Cause there's like, um, it's probably not very good quality on the zoom, but there's, uh, you know, opaque ones and transparent ones that are kind of melting together. And the, the different, uh, each, each one is kind of like a separate voxel piece of geometry. And I'm kind of boolean, booleaning them together so that the, the plastics are like overlapping, but not intersecting each other like they would be in real life. So the different colors are mixing together, but never um, intersecting each other exactly. I'm trying to make it as realistic as possible. Um, wow. And here's just another still from the, uh, <clears throat> the final video. Here's a, a still showing kind of that vortex. And here you can clearly see the, uh, you know, the different colors of plastic that are all kind of being melted together into that vortex. And um, then the last shot that I want to talk about, this one was fun because it's like this really tiny detail, but we spent a lot of effort on it because it was kind of like the last shot of the whole video. Um, at the very end of the video, um, we wanted to like hint back at the, the injection molded stuff, but still sort of like looking at the final keyboard. So we had like the, the finished keyboard and then at the very corner, there's like a little ripple that like shows that it's still a little bit liquid. And there's like a couple of droplets of plastic that kind of come off the corner. And um, I wanted to like turn those two droplets into an X and an O shape, um, starting as like a sphere that's part of the keyboard itself. Um, so I had to figure out, okay, first, how do I ripple, like send a ripple through the solid object? And so I had to figure out, uh, there's a particular Houdini uh, solver for generating ripples. And I used that um, to kind of send this ripple going through. And then um, I had these two sort of blobs that I had to animate by hand because I really wanted to be um, very deliberate about the motion of those. And I had to basically set up a, a thing that transitions them from you know, one shape to another. So like the topology had to stay the same between those two shapes. So I started with like the X and the O shape. Then I went backwards to figure out like, how can I turn them into spheres? And then basically have just like a slider that I can animate that switches them between one shape and the other as they kind of come off. And hopefully you can see this. Um, this is showing kind of how they transition from, you know, blobs to uh, these particular shapes which ended up working pretty well. And then here's the actual shot where you can see them coming off the corner and kind of float there for a few seconds before the video ends. Um, wow. so that was, that was a lot of work for that one shot, but it was, I think it was worth it because like I said, it's the last moment in the video and it's like that last little sort of Easter egg that you get to see of, um, you know, that last little sort of branded moment happen, um, which is pretty cool. It's shots so. like that, that really, just kind of bring it all home, you know, and just the, the real cherry on top. Um, and here's, here's the, uh, just a rendered version of that. Oh yeah. Yeah. And here's the final shot from the video, which the lighting is not quite as nice, but, um, you can see the, uh, little X and O show up there. <clears throat> Someone's saying it looks like it took weeks or months. <laughs> I'm trying to remember, I'm, I'm blanking on exactly how long this project was, but it was pretty fast paced. I'd say it, 
it's probably like a couple of months from start to finish. And we were doing it all in our free time, basically. So it was not like a, a wow. full-time thing for us. Um, Cause I was working with my coworker, Todd, and he's on my team. So he and I are busy doing meta stuff during the day. So this was really a side project. And and the other two animators were, were also working on other things at the same time as well. So. Well, uh, just all the visualization, if, if, if anybody watching hasn't heard of Rama works or, or the products mm-hmm. that they're, they're making um, go check them out on Instagram. Um, they they're doing some incredible, incredible stuff. The visualization is just super, very, very satisfying, especially if you're into, uh, you know, product design, technical stuff, materials, lighting, rendering, all of it. Um, it's really just nice to look at. Um, I, I, I want to drop a quick plug. Um, people yeah. should also check out, uh, there's a keyboard company called Hebe, which is actually, um, the designer who did a lot of the Ramaworks products has left and is now uh, working on a new brand called Hebe. Um, How do you spell that? H I B I dot M X is the, the website. And E-B-I-M-X. so, MX. Okay. And uh, my uh, coworker Todd is doing visualization for her now as well. So, very cool. I'm definitely going to check that check out that myself. Out. Yeah. <clears throat> well, so, so since we were talking, since you talked on it uh, a little bit here, um, talking about Houdini. Um, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about it as you go through your projects, but, um, if you could just explain for everybody watching briefly, what is Houdini? What does it do? Um, good, and maybe like good question. Um, yeah, it, let it me... seems like it was a means to, well, it seems like it was a means to an end as to why you got into it, but, um, yeah, totally. Just, if you could explain that. Let me actually skip to a particular slide because I think it'll be easier to show people, um, what Houdini actually looks like while I talk about it. Cause, um, all the stuff I just showed was not really, um, you know, not really giving you a lot of context of like what's actually happening in the software. Um, so let me <clears throat> present this. So this is what Houdini actually looks like. And, um, Houdini is really, it's a visual effects software. That's why it was, uh, created in the first place. It's, it's kind of a, a software, that has been around since like the early days of visual effects in the film industry. So it's kind of a a piece of software that has really evolved over time with, to keep up with the needs of um, visual effects artists who are working on feature films. Um, So that's kind of why it exists, but it's really amazing because it's this incredibly versatile tool that not only, um, you know, not only does it, uh, give you the ability to do, you know, high-end visual effects work for, you know, the movie industry, if that's what you want to do in your career. Um, but it's also an incredibly flexible uh, generative design and procedural uh, platform. It, it can do really almost anything that you can imagine and can figure out how to build in it. So that's why I like it. Cause I'm not really interested in um, <clears throat> doing like traditional visual effects work. Um, it's definitely not my, not my passion and not what I'm, uh, pursuing in my career. Like, I'm not really interested in like trying to simulate the ocean or exploding buildings or, or things like that. Um, which Houdini can do all of those things incredibly well. Um, but what I'm really interested in is, is using Houdini as more of a creative tool for exploring, uh, generative form finding and figuring out interesting ways to incorporate, uh, generative design into industrial design, and then also just having fun and honestly exploring a lot of the the abstract possibilities that exist with Houdini as well, because it it can do, like I said, pretty much anything that you can imagine. And um, it's really, I think there's a there's an artist named uh, Simon Holmdahl who uh, used to work for Man versus Machine. He gave a really good talk about Houdini that really is one of the things that convinced me to learn it. And he said that Houdini is like an operating system for 3D. And I think what he meant by that is it's really a blank slate and it's a, it's a, it's a framework, it's a set of tools, but it's really a blank slate that allows you to, it gives you the structure to build whatever you want to build. And really the only limiting factor is what you are smart enough to figure out how to build in it. Um, and a lot of the learning curve, uh, Houdini has, has a, a pretty, um, notorious learning curve, which scares a lot of people away from learning it. And um, <clears throat> unfortunately, that's just because it has so many, so much depth to it, so many layers to what it's capable of doing. And um, also just, you know, it's a, it's a node-based software, as you can see, um, a lot of the actual work in Houdini is constructing 
node networks um, that you know serve different purposes. You're essentially designing systems to um, create whatever outcome you want. And a lot of the difficulty with learning it is just wrapping your mind around how many, you know, all of the nodes that exist and all the different functions that you have at your fingertips and what do they do, how to use them together. Um, it's, it's a lot to, um, a lot to take in. And so it's something that has taken me many years to learn. Um, I, I'm gonna, I, I feel like I've been, I've been using Houdini since probably 2015, maybe 2016. And, um, you know, it's, it's been a really long process to get to the point where I am now where I can really open it up and, and start to design my own system and have an idea in my head of what I want to get out of it and be able to think backwards, um, you know, how to construct a system to, to do that. Like, for example, this thing we're looking at right here is a, it's a, a flower generation system. So it's like a whole system that's designed to be able to produce flowers of different, uh, different shapes with different numbers of petals, different petal shapes, different amount of, um, I guess, you know, different, different, uh, colors, different textures, different amount of like wrinkling to the petals, smooth petals, thick petals, thin petals, like every, everything you can imagine. And, you know, I tried to like build that into the system as a, as an option that could be adjusted to create different results. And I'll talk more about this later, but, um, that's just kind of like a, a high level overview of like what Houdini is. And, um, I would encourage people, if you're interested in, in learning more about it, um, there's a website called Antagma, E-N-T-A-G-M-A. -A. Um, they are, I would say, one of the best sort of educational resources for Houdini online. They have um, really high quality tutorials that even if you don't have an intent to learn Houdini, I think they'll just uh, looking at their content will give you a pretty good idea of, of what it's capable of, uh, of doing from like a more kind of motion design and, and design standpoint um, instead of a visual effects standpoint. Um, thanks for going through that. And what this kind of makes me think of while you were explaining, I guess, like the under the hood of, of Houdini is, um, something that we might see more of, and I think we're starting to see glimpses of, but sort of AI generated 3d. Um, and I imagine it would work very similar to this, where there's sort of these structures, these systems that it works within to, um, to create, obviously this is a manual way of doing it. You know, you're building it yourself, but I could very much see someone creating these systems that could be more automated and I guess intuitively generated um, to create uh, some sort of outcome where you could just input a few words like, the, like we're seeing um, sort of with the image generated, image AI generated stuff that we're seeing right now. Totally. Um, this just makes me think of that. I don't, know, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that yourself. Well, in like a short-term way, there's definitely um, AI tools that I wish existed for 3D. Like, I think it would be awesome to have um, <clears throat> simple things like uh, an AI quad remesher that would be able to take any mesh you throw at it and use AI to figure out a nice topology. There's already like things that are approaching that, but nothing that's quite as, uh, <clears throat> as useful as I would like it to be. Um, you know, things like uh, AI tools for like UV mapping, like figuring out how to texture things automatically would be amazing. Um, yeah. Or even texture generation tools using AI would be super cool, um, like for generating materials. Um, you know, those are all like, you know, taking a, a particular pain point within like the overall 3D workflow and giving you an AI tool that addresses that pain point. But I can also imagine tools that are more like, um, you know, Dolly or something for, for 3D that are, you know, really taking a, a prompt that you give it and creating a whole asset for you, which I think would be, uh, that's definitely farther out than, um, some of the stuff that I'm talking about, but it's probably not as far out as, uh, as I think it would be, it's probably on the horizon. So it'd definitely be interesting to see what happens when that's possible. Yeah, absolutely. I, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's inevitable. Um, and yeah, it's just really incredible to see what people are doing uh, right now, even just with the image stuff. Um, and, uh, like I've been seeing, you know, people that I follow, um, creating art, like amazing pieces of art, um, that are completely AI generated and, um, the ability for an individual to create a pretty compelling visual, anything is, is becoming so much more accessible. And so it's, yeah, it's only inevitable. I think of in, until that gets into 3d, um, like the AI tools of, of fusion 360 are, are 
are, I think, uh, just a fraction, sort of small little piece of probably what we'll be able to do in the near future. Um, that still requires a lot of inputs, but um, yeah, it's a very interesting topic. Definitely. But uh, yeah, I will allow you to continue. I'm sure we could talk a lot about uh, AI stuff. Definitely. I think for the sake of time, I'm actually going to skip um, <clears throat> skip the Subvert 87 project just because it's it's an, the oldest yeah. project in this uh, in my presentation, and it's very much just like a traditional sort of 3D modeling project. I think it'd be a lot more interesting to skip into the uh, <clears throat> more in depth generative design stuff since that's what we've been talking about. If you're cool with that, yeah, uh, absolutely. Cool. Um, so I wanted to spend some time talking about lattice structures, because this is one of the things that I've spent a lot of time thinking about in, um, <clears throat> in Houdini and, and in 3D in general, and, and basically trying to figure out like a bridge between <clears throat> some of the generative design techniques that I've learned and more of like an industrial design workflow. Um, so um, to start off with, I just wanted to share some more abstract stuff that kind of began this exploration. Um, this is actually um, some work that I created as a part of a class that I took, which is um, led by this guy named Javier Ruiz, who is uh, an educator who is also an architect, but he does a lot of uh, his main focus is kind of like generative tools within the architecture industry um, and procedural sort of forms in architecture. Um, he's got a website called Soft Biome. I would encourage people to check it out. It's got a lot of <clears throat> different classes on it that focus on different topics within the realm of kind of generative form creation with, with kind of a focus on architecture, but um, I found it to be very applicable to <clears throat> the things that I wanted to do as well, which don't have anything to do with architecture. So um, check that out. But basically the, the one class that I took from him was focused on kind of like being able to generate these sort of procedural lattice structures from uh, different inputs that you could control. So imagine, and, th and these are like very organic lattice structures. So they're not really very like ordered and regular. They're very kind of like adaptive to the geometry that you put into them and, and um, kind of more, more abstract, not necessarily as functional as something like an Adidas, like 3D printed, you know, midsole or something like that. But just like, um, I just had fun with this because I thought it was a really uh, beautiful uh, output and was really fun to explore different forms and different patterns um, using this uh, this particular workflow, which basically is just like you're you're basically giving it different sets of points that are based on some input geometry, and it's trying to figure out like the most efficient way to connect those points together to create a structure. Um, and you have a lot of different inputs, and and what you get out of it really. Um, depends on the input geometry. And so when you start to feed it things that are really symmetrical or, or radial symmetrical, um, someone was asking what software this is. This is also in Houdini. Um, so, you know, you, you can get these things that really look um, like they came out of nature um, just because of that symmetry. And so this was just, wow. um, you know, a lot of fun to explore. Um, again, like not super practical. Um, I don't know what the ap actual application for this would be. It's just kind of a fun fun thing to, uh, to explore these forms. Um, but the next thing that I wanted to do after taking that class was figure out a more sort of practical approach to creating lattice structures in Houdini. And I wanted to basically be able to have like any, any form um, that I wanted to throw into Houdini and be able to generate like a pretty cool and also very functional lattice structure from that form. And so my starting point was like the most obvious thing you could do, which is basically just take a shape any arbitrary shape and like fill it with like little cubes of uh, lattice structure, you know, um, which works for generating a 3D lattice, but it creates like these really rough kind of edges on everything because you're just essentially just have these blocks and the blocks are just like truncated at the ends and there's nothing to kind of make it feel, you know, refined and cohesive on the outside. <clears throat> so that was where I started. And this is just like a little visualization to kind of imagine that, like if this circle was like a cross section of that shape, um, you're basically just filling it with little blocks and each block represents a piece of the lattice structure. Um, and so my next thought was like, well, can you like relax that? So like you can kind of like conform those cubes to the outside surface of your shape to try and make something that's a little bit more, uh, I don't know, refined looking. So that was my next thought. So these are some of the results um, <clears throat> from that, which I think 
when you're using a very basic shape, like on the left, it works pretty well. Like you're kind of relaxing that lattice structure out to the edges of the, of the form. And it looks pretty, pretty nice. But then when you throw it at like a really complex shape, like on the right, um, it just looks really messy and doesn't really give you that like really nice, um, you know, nice clean surface on the outside that looks very considered. This looks kind of messy still. And so I wasn't, I wasn't like, wasn't into that. Um, so my next, uh, next thought was like, um, I was going to try to apply that to a shoe sole and like figure out a really, um, sort of, uh, practical way of figuring out all this stuff in the context of a shoe sole. And I actually was working on a freelance project, um, uh, for a, a footwear brand that wanted to do 3d printed shoe soles. And so I had a good motivation to figure out how to do this because the, uh, guy I was working with really wanted to figure out a way to create our own sort of custom 3d printed soles, similar to what Adidas would do, um, with carbon 40 <clears throat> and carbon 40 has their own software for doing this stuff, but we didn't have access to it and didn't want to pay for it. So I was kind of like trying to figure out how to do this on my own, um, just for fun. So starting out again with like a very simple example, um, just taking a very regular lattice structure and uh, populating it in, in a shape. Um, then um, obviously you need to be able to conform that to a curved uh, midsole because the midsole is not just a rectilinear object. It has a lot of curvature to it and it's got a footbed that changes and it's got you know side profiles that change as they wrap around the shoe. And so what I was basically experimenting with here is having like a top surface and a bottom surface that you can control. Um, and then building your lattice cubes in between those two surfaces, like a loft operation in CAD, um, and then have like a side surface that can also have a contour that you then expand the, the loft to fill so that you basically have a, a form that has regular sort of lattices up and down and conforms to the curvature of the outside profile as well. Um, so going along that, uh, that direction. Um, these are some of the studies that I had done to try and figure out how to get that curvature working with the cells in between. And then here's starting to actually look at a more of a footwear specific uh, application or footwear geometry. And so you can see there's like different layers um, between the top and the bottom. And that dictates, you know, how many lattice cells you're going to have between the top and the bottom. <clears throat> you know, you've got the top curvature, the bottom curvature, and then a side surface. Um, and this is kind of the, one of the first kind of successful tests that I did where, you know, I'm building those, um, you know, lattice cells between the top and the bottom. And here you can see, I'm also taking that outside surface, the side surface and using it almost, almost like a skin where I'm, I want to be able to like really control the aesthetic of the, the outside surface of the lattice as well. Cause the inside is very functional. It's just a, it's a very specific lattice structure that is, you know, trying to absorb the, you know, the impact of your steps and so forth. You can't really get too creative with it because it needs to be very functional, but then the outside skin, you can be more creative with because it, as long as it can compress along with the, um, you know, the, the motion of the shoe, um, you can kind of style it however you want. So I, I basically separated out that outside surface as like a skin and, um, started to think about like, what are some different sort of pattern elements that I could put on the outside. And this is all being done with uh, VDBs again, which are those voxels that I mentioned before. And what that does is it allows you to have, you know, these different elements all be sort of blended together very seamlessly so that at the end you have one airtight mesh that you could easily 3D print and not have to worry about there being, you know, weird geometry and consistencies and stuff like that. Um, so here's me like starting to figure out like, or starting to experiment with, you know, how you could skin the outside of that mesh with different kinds of patterns. So this one is actually like taking a solid surface and sort of perforating it. And um, you get some really nice, um, uh, just kind of like a interesting geometric look to the outside. Um, here's more of like a, something that looks a lot more like what Adidas might do, um, which is basically just like creating a, you know, sort of like a, uh, an extension of that internal lattice structure that wraps around the outside. Um, here's one where I wanted to try putting some like lines, um, some horizontal lines that kind of follow the curvature of the, um, of the, uh, midsole. And this is cool because they're, they're, you know, totally integrated into the lattice structure, but they kind of stand out as this sort of graphical element on the outside. Wow. Um, here's a rendered version of, of the one I showed before that has those perforations. Um, and then here's just a bunch of different, um, I, I probably did like two dozen different pattern studies on this, but these are just some of my favorites. 
um, just showing you how you wow. can take the same, the same geometry and just kind of style it a little bit differently um, with different sort of, you know, lattice on the outside. <clears throat> this is and amazing. Course- it's just the possibility, the possibilities are, are endless. <laughs> like, I mean, it, it's, especially with using the, you know, sort of shaping the outside, um, you know, creating these, I guess, boundary surfaces, at least that's how, like, what makes sense in my, yeah. in my mind. It's um, a good way to think about it. It's just yeah. like, it's, it's, it's incredible. Like what you can create with um, sort of with these generated structures and, um, and from a manufacturing standpoint, I mean, the only way to, you can make these is, is through 3d printing. Um, it's the only, it's the only physical, you know, way that these could be made. Um, which I think is still such a cool thing um, that there's, you know, there's, there's, there's production methods that just injection molding cannot do. Um, and as we move further into like these AI generated or generative, you know, processes, um, we're definitely, I feel like we're just definitely going to see a lot more of this, um, you know, FDM sort of, uh, or S or SLS, you know, way of making things, uh, has to get faster, obviously, but yeah. And um, I saw, I saw some people in the comments talking about like the feasibility of, of 3d printed shoes in general. And also how do you, how do you test these to make sure that they actually work? And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical about like whether or not 3d printed shoes are actually, uh, the most practical way to make shoes. I'm not sure if they are, but I think one of the things that, um, the guy I was working with was really passionate about is using, uh, basically 3d scanning to sort of customize the, you know, the shoe sole to your foot. So it's not just, a uh, like buying an off the shelf pair of shoes. It's actually made, you know, specifically for you. So it's going to work well with your, your gait and with the specific shape of your foot and so forth. Yeah. So, um, yeah, anyway, huge. that was kind of the, the thought behind this. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so I also experimented with just like some different, uh, different form language and different contours for the, the outsole. Um, this one's pretty cool. It's kind of like a split, uh, construction. So you've got kind of like a, a pod in the back and then two pods in the front with like a slight gap in the middle. And then there's kind of like this solid structure that sort of marries the entire thing together. And this is like the, the beauty of working with, um, VDBs is that you can have all these different voxel pieces and blend them together super seamlessly. And since your end goal is 3d printing, you don't need to worry about, you know, the, um, having CAD basically at the end of the process that you could send to a manufacturer to, to mold or something like that. Um, so this is kind of approaching the, um, the design that I was working on refining, um, I did some kind of, th- th- there would be kind of like an outsole adhered to the bottom of this. Um, but I was just having fun, like exploring patterns that would be hidden, um, underneath the outsole and that would provide a surface for it to be adhered to. Um, That's someone cool. was asking if this is all Houdini, it is all Houdini, um, except for, uh, the rendering engine is Redshift. Um, that's what I was rendering these with. That's what I render most of my work with is uh, Redshift. You, you can't render in Houdini, can you? Or you can. can. Houdini supports okay. um, all manner of uh, rendering engines. It has its own um, kind of first-party rendering solutions, but then it also supports third-party renderers as well. So I, I use Redshift as like a third-party renderer for Houdini. Um, and also in Cinema 4D, which is the other 3D software that I use a lot. <clears throat> um, but anyway, so here's, here's just a quick sort of visualization of how that all could look on a, a final shoe uh, with a knit uh, upper and everything. That's beautiful. And uh, yeah, that's the end of uh, this project. So hopefully that helps kind of illustrate, you know, how some of these uh, generative design techniques can be applied to actually making a real product because, you know, a lot of it feels very abstract and like, you know, fun, it's fun to learn, but like, what's the actual real, like practical applications of it. And you know, here's one, you know, practical application that you could uh, conceivably use that for. So. Yeah, I love that project. Um, I'm glad that you covered that one, uh, just because you know it's it further going into the generative stuff. And, you know, it's just um, it, to see you know the real world applications. I mean, it's it's it is being used. I mean, the the Adidas. I don't remember the name of the shoe, but Adidas is actually doing it. Um, you know, on a on a production level, and so um, it's it's definitely food for thought for all the creators, designers watching on on how these can be incorporated into your designs and into your 
um, you know, and to, whether it's physical or not, um, you know, it, it's not just for physical, but, uh, you know, new ways of, of working and, and thinking through how things can be implemented. So totally. Um, and I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the time. So I want to share yeah. one more project because we, we are probably going to run out of time. Um, and I, I assumed that would happen. So that's yeah. going according to plan. Um, but I want to <laughs> share, um, my Fisarum project, because I think it's, it's something that I've spent a lot of time on and have only really gotten to talk about in uh, a couple of venues. And so I really want to share, um, more about this because I think it's pretty, um, it's just something I think is really cool and, and fascinating for people. So um, <clears throat> let me go ahead and dive into this. Um, so this this project really stems from uh, kind of a fascination that I had as a kid with like the microscopic world. So I, I used to like go out into my backyard and take like a, uh, I had like a little toy microscope um, when I was a kid and I would like take a little sample of water from like the, the bird bath that my parents had in the backyard, which had like a bunch of algae growing in it and stuff. And I would look at that, uh, you know, look at that under the microscope and, you know, see all kinds of weird and interesting uh, <clears throat> creatures moving around in there. And I was just fascinated by the fact that like, there's this entire world that exists that's, you know, outside of our perception. And, you know, it's a whole world unto itself. If you were that scale, you know, it's as, as meaningful as the, the world that we experience at, at our scale. So <clears throat> that was something that always kind of fascinated me and, um, I, I never really pursued that in any particular way. It was just something I thought was cool. Um, but uh, I had an opportunity to take a class um, about uh, almost two years ago now, actually, the time is flying. Um, and it was a class about how to use something called compute shaders in Unity to create generative art. And it really inspired me to create a whole body of work around the idea of kind of microscopic um, organisms and structures and um, just art for the sake of art. It wasn't really, it doesn't have any purpose other than just being visually interesting and, and cool. And uh, I have to credit a couple of people. Um, Sage Jensen is uh, an artist who kind of really lit this fire of inspiration under me. He's a, um, a generative artist who... Uh, does just absolutely amazing uh, real-time graphics that are inspired by um, inspired by nature, inspired by microscopic organisms, and are also just really beautiful. Um, so he, um, their work is one of my, my my big inspirations. And then also there's another artist um, who goes by the handle Arsiliath, and he is also a generative artist who works in Unity, um, who is uh, you know doing essentially real-time uh, biology or like abstract biological inspired work, um, essentially kind of trying to create organisms, uh, fake, fake, fake organisms that are really beautiful and interesting, um, using GPU computing to run them in real time and using, uh, programming and game engines like unity to, um, bring them to life. And he's the one who, who created a class about how to do this stuff that I took. And, um, it really just opened my mind as far as what's possible to actually get a computer to create or as sort of like a, a tool, right? Um, so I have to define some things because I just said a bunch of stuff that's probably pretty foreign, uh, I imagine, to a lot of people who are listening. Um, you know, first of all, Unity. Unity is a game engine. Um, it's a, a game engine that people use to make games games um, and it's really easy to learn um, but it does require you to program stuff so you have to learn programming in order to use a game engine for the most part there are a few game engines that don't require you to program but most of them do and uh, so everything you're about to see in this project relies very very heavily on programming it's all programming um, all the results of programming and um, within unity so unity is a game engine but you can also use it as a, a tool for creating uh, just abstract art as well you don't have to use it to make games and so it's really good for any kind of real time graphic stuff that you want to do as far as experimenting with different things. And so one of the, the, uh, the techniques within Unity is something called a compute shader. And a compute shader is literally just a piece of code. It's a program that runs on your GPU. Um, your CPU sends information to it. It does some computations on the GPU, sends you an image back, and that's it. Um, so everything you're about to see are sort of the, these sort of programs that are written for the GPU to create some kind of artwork for you. And it happens in real time. And that's kind of the benefit of doing it on the GPU is that you can have these really detailed simulations that are able to run at real time speeds. Um, 
So let me play a little video. Hopefully the quality is not too bad. Um, but this is like a little compilation of uh, some of the uh, work that I've done using compute shaders in Unity um, to try and simulate stuff that feels kind of like a microscopic world or feels like an organism that you're able to uh, kind of watch evolve over time. Um, and, and these are all simulations that have anywhere between a million and like 20 million particles that are all being simulated in, in real time at sometimes up to as much as 4K resolution um, on the GPU. And um, the way that that's possible is um, through some very clever uh, programming techniques, which I can talk about soon. Um, but all of this is inspired by uh, a real organism called Fissarum, uh, Fissarum polycephalum, which is a slime mold. And slime molds are basically these organisms that are really good at uh, optimizing the transport of nutrients over space. And so they're basically, they send out these little tendrils and they look for nutrients. And when they find them, they build networks to transport those nutrients back to the main organism. And the process, it creates these really complex structures, which are really cool. Um, and the technique that I'm, be, I'm using on these is basically trying to simulate that type of an organism um, through some very fundamental rules that um, guide the behavior of these particles. So each particle kind of represents a, a part of this larger organism that's sort of trying to optimize itself as it travels around the, uh, the canvas. And the way that works is um, we have some points that are moving in random directions on a grid. Um, as they move around, they deposit a trail behind them so that they're essentially leaving a history of where they've been. Um, over time, those trails are faded out so that the whole thing doesn't fill up over time. Because if you imagine like the particles leaving trails that never go away, you're eventually just going to have a, a solid image and that wouldn't be cool. So the trails that they leave kind of fade out over time. Um, there's also a diffusion that happens, which basically means that um, the trails that they leave kind of blur out um, into the space that they're in, which allows them to be easier for other particles to detect. Um, each particle itself has three eyes essentially, or three sensors that are looking at the environment around them. Um, there's a left, a middle, a right one. Um, they're separated by a certain uh, angle and they're a certain distance away from the particle, which changes the way that they behave. Um, they also have a turn radius, which defines how uh, quickly they're able to turn in one direction or the other. And basically what they're doing is they're just looking at the trails that are left by the other particles around them. And they are turning towards the direction with the strongest trail and that's it. Um, they're just turning based on their turn angle and based on the trails that they've sampled using the three sensors. And the end result of all of that is you get a simulation that ends up looking pretty organic, which is pretty interesting. Um, so here's some very basic ones. Um, these are what you can get with just a, you know, maybe like 10,000 particles on a grid, just moving around with very basic settings. Um, you can create these kind of patterns, which are really interesting. And if you up that to like a 4K grid with millions and millions of particles and increase the complexity of the behavior by adding things like uh, acceleration or drag or being able to like vary the parameters of the particles depending on their uh, environment, you can get really complex patterns like these. Um, so I, I went through um, just a, a massive process of iteration once I learned how to do this and um, have these kind of like different generations of systems that I explored. And I'm not, I'm not going to go too into detail on uh, some of these because I know we're running out of time, but um, I just wanted to, oops, I guess we've got a little video here. Um, I'm going to skip this one actually and go to, to the, go to some of the more recent ones. Um, well, this one's pretty cool. Um, but basically, I've just been kind of like iterating on on these systems and trying to figure out new ways to make the, um, you know, make the simulations more, more interesting by figuring out like, you know, how, how can I make them more complex? And the first thing I figured out is like, well, if you have two different species of particles that each have their own behaviors, um, or their own parameters, then you get much more complex, uh, results because instead of just one set of parameters on your particles, you've got two and they're interacting with each other as well. Um, so all the simulations you're seeing here actually have two different species of particles that are interacting with each other. Um, so that's one example. Um, another is, um, I'm going to skip this one. Nope. Two species of skip particles. <laughs> one. Yeah. And then these, these actually have three, three different species of particles. So there's two species that are following the Fasarum logic that I just outlined. Um, 
And so then there's a third species that's following a different computer uh, algorithm called Boyd's. And Boyd's tries to simulate uh, flocking, um, basically the behavior of flocking birds. And so when you combine them together, you get these sort of like uh, trails and all of the fasarum particles are kind of following the trails, which are sort of like the, the flocking birds that are leading them in different directions. And so you get much more like directional um, looking stuff, which is pretty cool. And I've got a video of that so you can see what I mean. But um, the, the other way that these work is that um, wow. it's, all, it's all designed to be randomized. So it's very hard to like manually dial in the different simulation settings to arrive upon like a particular result that's interesting. You really have to, I, I think like the, the interesting stuff happens with uh, you know, randomized settings where you don't necessarily know what the outcome is going to be. You're just kind of exploring what happens when you randomize the settings to different ways or different or uh, you know different numbers basically, and um, so basically I set this up so that you just have a button on your keyboard that you press and it randomizes the entire system each time. So each time you press that random button, um, you get a completely new set of uh, behavior and a completely new simulation. And some of them are really boring. Um, the ones that I've captured here are the more interesting ones. Um, so you're kind of almost curating like the results of the simulation. So you're exploring them and then you're cur curating them to the, uh, the most interesting ones. Um, someone asked how many parameters are involved in this. Um, some of these sy systems have anywhere between like 50 and 100 different parameters that you could change. So as you can imagine, like it's impossible to go through and fine tune 100 different parameters, right? So that's why you really need to be able to use the computer to your advantage to do that randomization for you and act as more of like a explorer, you know, exploring these different possibilities and finding the coolest ones uh, rather than fine tuning them manually. Um, this is the same video as before, so I'm going to skip that. Um, but anyway, so these are, these are some of the most recent ones that I've been exploring and um, really like the, the, the main changes with these are um, they're basically able to um, like the, the behavior of the particles actually changes in the regions where there's more density of particles. And so they, they kind of get different behavior when they're like out by themselves in like an area with not a lot of activity versus if they're in a cluster where there's a lot of neighbors around them, they actually change their behavior um, with these. And so that leads to some really, um, you know, much more complex um, and interesting shapes that you can get with these. <clears throat> But anyway, I know, I know this so is very like, yeah, I know this is like very abstract and it's like hard to kind of grasp what actually is happening behind the scenes. Um, but, you know, in reality, I just have a unity window with this running and a bunch of sliders and it's all based on, uh, you know, hundreds of lines of code that I had to learn how to write. And that's really uh, thanks to our Ciliath, who I mentioned before, who has a class about this stuff. So if you're, if this is interesting to you at all, and you're not afraid of learning programming, um, and I would say that no one should be afraid of learning programming. It's really not that, uh, not that difficult to learn the basics. Um, you should check out Arsiliath. He has workshops that are going on uh, right now. So you can sign up for one of those and um, learn how to do this stuff yourself. And, and I know we're, we're out of time, so that's where I'll end it. <laughs> yeah, Tim, thank you so much. I mean, this was just so inspiring. And um, I, I just, I've been watching the comments as they've been coming through. Um, I think people are really interested in sort of like, I think maybe the directions that this could take them in their own work. Um, also just like, how the heck do you do this? Um, you know, <laughs> and, um, I mean, I think you touched on it a little bit of maybe how we, how you could go about learning. Um, it seems like the baseline, um, for a lot of this is like, um, if you really want to get into this type of work, you probably want to learn coding. It sounds like. Um, and that's true for Houdini as well. Like Houdini, yeah. you can do a lot in Houdini without needing to know how to write any code whatsoever. Um, but I think to really unlock the potential of a lot of these tools, um, and this is more of like an advanced user thing. So like, you know, when you're first starting out learning Houdini, if you're not already comfortable with programming, you don't have to dive into those things right away. Um, but I think programming really does unlock a lot of the potential of, um, of the software as far as just being able to do things really efficiently and being able to like, make your own custom nodes that do exactly what you want them to do. Um, it's, it's definitely extremely powerful. And uh, 
I used to be afraid of programming and um, I'm glad that I got over that fear because it has really given me a lot of um, just potential to, to create things that I would never have been able to create any other way. So. Yeah, it's good to hear because I think, I think a lot of uh, creators, designers, mm-hmm. artists out there feel similar uh, a similar way about coding uh, just because I think there's a percep- perception that it's not, it's, it's a, nev- it's a different way of thinking um, which it probably is in a lot of ways, but it definitely um, is for sure. It, yeah. And um, but I, as for, I mean, for someone like you, I mean, you're obviously a designer, artist, creator, and, and, and yet you're able to wield these tools, you know, fairly well. Um, maybe if you could just briefly, you know, just touch on what that, maybe that click moment was for you when you were learning coding and, and how you started to feel more confident uh, in using it. Uh, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> probably a difficult question for me to answer because I don't recall any one moment where I had mm-hmm. that like, aha, like suddenly it, you know, I'm not afraid of programming anymore. It's really just been a, <clears throat> a long process of like exposing myself to it over time in mm-hmm. first in like small, small bits of just like, you know, writing one or two lines of code in Houdini to like, that I learned from a tutorial. You know, I don't, I didn't start by knowing what any of it actually did. You just, you know, see someone use something in a tutorial, you copy what they did. It works great. You can move on without having to actually learn what the, what the programming does. But over time, like you do want to learn what the programming does because um, you want to be able to customize it and and change the functionality and really do things yourself. And so, um, you know, really for me, I think there, there's definitely like a stigma, I think around like, especially artists thinking that programming is like a different domain that's like separate from their own and like the domain of, you know, software engineers or, you know, web developers or whatever. Um, And I would just encourage people not to think that because coding is a tool that's accessible to anyone who is interested in learning it. And it doesn't have to be something that you approach the same way that a software engineer would approach or a web developer would approach. Um, You can approach it in the way that uh, makes sense for you and is, you know, even if that's just like learning one or two lines of some script that allows you to do something a little bit more efficiently or or do something you wouldn't be able to do before, um, all the way to, you know, where I'm at now, just like being able to program, you know, Unity simulations from scratch, which you know, I would never have been able to do that without um, some of the amazing classes that I have taken um, from Arsiliath and, and others. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't really have any other advice other than just don't. I, I would just encourage people to be open-minded about it because um, if it's something that yeah. scares you or something that you've traditionally felt like was too technical or too, um, you know, inaccessible or or just wasn't something that you thought you could do. Um, just to try not to think that because um, if you have an open mind about it, you could, you'd be surprised at what you can do and um, how useful it can be for your workflow, depending on what you're interested in doing. So one thing I want to add on to that myself is, um, and I think you would agree with this, Tim is, is something that can help with learning a new thing, a new tool is giving yourself a specific project or a specific outcome um, rather than, rather than learning the tool or learning all of coding at once. Um, instead of, because if you look at your own journey, if you look at your, if you look at your trajectory, it was one thing led to another, um, your interests, your passions sort of were the initial driver and the tools were kind of a means to getting to those things. And totally, it it seems, it seems to me that that's consistent in your own story, but in a lot of other people that I've talked to as well is that. Um, they just learn things because they were inspired and driven be- by a, I guess, a, a core, you know, pure desire to render this thing or, or learn how to make this object. Or in your case, you know, you were inspired by these, by, you know, the, the microscopic world ever since a kid, it's ever since you were a child. And so um, I would, ju- I would just add that little, my little two cents onto that as well for everyone out there is just like, you know, find something that you're really passionate about and you know what tool can get you to that place and i think you'll find yourself um on a journey and being able to you know sort of uh, similar to tim you know you know finding these tools that allow you to express whatever you're trying to show the world but um i i agree with that 100 and 
the other thing you said is that, you know, a tool can be a, a means to an end, but I think once you learn a tool really well, it can also be a source of inspiration too. Mm. Um, like I think for me, Houdini is like a, a constant source of inspiration just because it's like this blank canvas with infinite possibilities. And it has all of these tools that exist purely to enable you to do things that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Um, and I think that's really inspiring. I want to, I want to, shamelessly plug. Um, I didn't talk about it at all, but, uh, you know, I obviously worked for gravity sketch and, um, I couldn't help but think at certain moments when you were talking through your projects that to me, gravity sketch very much feels like a blank canvas tool as well. Um, for just that, I guess that initial moment of inspiration or that, or that initial moment, initial moment of trying to get whatever is in your mind out, um, into 3d as quickly as possible and not worried of being worried about, um, precision or being worried about expressing it in the most precise specific way, but, but more so just getting into a 3d space, um, without drop down menus, buttons, but just, just so you can see it. And then you can, you can begin to work it out in 3d. Um, that's, that's, that to me is the real essence of what gravity sketch allows you to do. Um, and so I just wanted to mention that, but I think it's related to what we've been talking about in, in your own journey of, of the tools that you've been using. Yeah. And well. I also just wanted to say that, you know, I think gravity sketch is a great tool. And also someone mentioned in the comments that um, it would be really cool to see these in VR. And that's actually a goal of mine is to figure out how to port these simulations into VR so that you can experience them as kind of like a, a full, you know, 360 degree that experience. Would be sweet. Um, so that's on my, on my agenda of, of things to learn how to do at some point. Um, I want to say we have, there's a lot of questions on here that we just haven't really touched on. We are past time. Um, and I do want to stick to the time that we allotted for this. Um, so we will find a way to address these questions, um, whether we can have Tim answer them in a type form and post them. Um, that might be the most efficient way to do it. Um, but I want to sincerely thank all of you and, and thank you, Tim, for your time today and, and going through your projects and explaining your journey, explaining your process. I, I have, there's so many, I could talk a lot more about this, honestly. There's, there's a lot more things I could just discuss with you. I think it's just so fascinating, like, you know, how much this replicates nature or how rather these processes are inspired by nature and how nature works. Like, I, I just think there's a whole, this is a go, this is go much, could go much longer, but um for sure. I just want to thank you for your time and uh, thank you for, for giving us a little bit of a glimpse into um, how you found your own way. In, uh, yeah. Well, creating. thank you so much for having me. It's obviously uh, an honor to have the, uh, the platform to share my work with everyone. And I hope that everyone enjoyed it. Awesome. Um, one, one more, one thing I want to uh, put out is a little poll. If you guys could just let me know. Um, was this helpful? Was it educational? What'd you think? Um, you know, let me know. Uh, you know, this is, I think our first webinar where we didn't have anything explicitly gravity sketch, but we really just wanted to expose both of our communities, Tim's community, gravity sketch community to, um, something that is just pure inspiration, a new way of working, um, zeroing in, zeroing in on, uh, someone in the, in the design community, art community, wherever you want to categorize yourself, Tim, <laughs> all, uh, all of the above. <laughs> yeah. And, and to different ways of working and, and how you could do it yourself. So hundred percent, um, more webinars like this, uh, which is great. Awesome. Um, well just want to thank everybody again for joining. And, um, in case you missed it in the beginning, I mentioned that we will be posting this in its entirety on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you jumped in late or if you, you know, hopped off early or whatever, we'll be having it. So you can, you can watch it in its full, in its full form. So again, thank you everybody. Thank you, Tim. And, uh, we'll see you again. Oh, and before, before we sign off, um, sure. someone is asking for my contact information. I just wanted to, oh, yeah. uh, Please. Switch to yeah. a slide where I have that so people can see, um, my website is uh, zarky.net. Uh, my email is tim at zarky.net and my Instagram handle is, uh, Zarki with underscores on each side. Um, so feel free to reach out to me on uh, any of those platforms and I'll try to get back to you when I can. Also reminds me, um, I'm going to, I'm going to promote it because I 
used it myself. And I think that um, it would be great for everybody else here. I know you said it's kind of old, Tim, but if you want to try out uh, Tim's course um, on Learn Squared, I believe um, it's a great course on just the basics of industrial basics of industrial design, taking you through, um, you know, how to design something uh, while all the while designing something throughout the course. Um, and uh, it's a really great practical uh, practical way of, of, of approaching just product design. Um, but uh, I'd highly recommend it. I took the course myself. So definitely check that out. Well, thanks a lot. It means a lot to me. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Tim. Well, thank you for having me. And thanks everyone for joining. Appreciate it. All right. See you, everybody.